and welcome to Changing Minds. Today, it is my pleasure to welcome our guest, Professor Susan Fisk, who is the Eugene Higgins Professor of Psychology and Public Policy at Princeton University. Hi, Susan, and welcome. Hi, Lasana. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. So I think we'll just start with a general question that looks at your reactions as a researcher who studies social biases. What were your thoughts when you saw the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter movement unfolding? Well, I think it's very important that both movements brought collective voices to bear on problems that are not new, but uh, framing them as a movement made people, forced, forced people to pay attention. People who might otherwise be uncomfortable with it or might otherwise wonder whether it's real. You know, when, when one person has an issue with authorities or with um, inappropriate behavior, uh, you know, you could easily dismiss one person and there are lots of alternative explanations for why that person is bringing the complaint. But when you have large crowds of people saying, this happened to me, or this happened to a family member, it's harder to deny it. And as awkward and uncomfortable as it sometimes makes people to deal with these issues, it's really critical that we do that at a minimum because we're wasting human talent. That's wonderful. So you think therefore that these movements have an impact not only on the societal level, but on individuals themselves, right? There was this whole blossoming of allyship, as it was called, which is really a term that people borrowed from the um, sexual preference movements that has now been applied to all of these movements. And you saw in Me Too cases of men getting involved and, and sort of taking a stand. In addition, in Black Lives Matter movement, again, you saw white people sort of marching in the streets. So you think that sort of represents something significant as well? Well, I'm, I'm really, really impressed uh, by the racial integration of the Black Lives Matter protests. I mean, those were risky protests to participate in because there was police uh, violence. And, you know, so I, I was really pleased to see a younger generation getting worried about this. You know, it's, it's such an endemic problem in American society elsewhere too, but, you know, for us, our founding papers, <laughs> you know, <laughs> codify all this. And um, so I was just glad to see that, it, you know, when it's, when it's mainly oppressed people who are speaking for themselves, it's too easy for other people to dismiss it as self-interest. Yeah. That's wonderful, a wonderful point, I think. And I was very sort of pleased to see that as well. It sparked a global movement, I think, which is, is really interesting and important to have. So now I wanna dive a little bit deeper and uh, talk about what psychology can tell us about social biases, racial bias, gender bias. We've been studying this in social psychology for well over, what is it, 80 years? And so I often tell people there's a huge body of research out there that addresses these problems. So not asking you to review 80 years of research, mm -hmm. but sort of very succinctly, could you talk a little bit about what psychology has to say about these biases? Sure. Well, I would say that um, psychology differentiates between people who are blatant bigots or blatant sexists of any kind, you know, who are willing, quite willing to say, you know, I hate women, I think they're stupid, or I hate black people, I think they're stupid. I mean, so there, are, I used to say, you know, in modern democracies, it was 10% of the population. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm sorry to say it's more, but anyway, so there's, but there's a lunatic fringe on one end. Mm -hmm. um, and there is maybe, uh, an egalitarian fringe on the other end, but the vast majority of people are not like that. They're not extreme. And in modern um, democracies, I think most people are well-intentioned, but inept because uh, of de facto segregation of their lives from people who are different from them. And so what, I, what, so, what social psychology has mostly to say to people is this middle batch of people 
you know, call it 60%, 80%, I don't know what it is. I think it's big. Um, is to say that, that, you know, that's most of us, you know, even those of us who think we're beyond any kind of bias. And what, what I would say to people who are either those people or who are managing those people, um, bias is more automatic than you think, it's more ambiguous than you think, and it's more ambivalent than you think. And I can talk about any of those, but, but the point is that if it's automatic, ambiguous, and ambivalent, then you can't detect it in yourself. You don't notice when you're doing it. It's unconscious, it's not crystal clear, and so on. So what that means is that somebody else has to keep track. If you're in a position of authority, if you're hiring people or promoting people or making decisions about people, somebody else, namely the organization, has to watch the patterns of hiring, promotion, and so on. And if it just happens that underrepresented groups, women or underrepresented minorities, don't do so well in your setting, you have to ask yourself why. And so, you know, I think it doesn't take responsibility off the individual to know that these things are hard to detect because we're all responsible for the decisions we make. And, you know, maybe the first nanosecond, you don't know that you're reacting in a certain way, but at what you do after that, you're responsible for it. But <clears throat> still organizations have to be aware in this day and age that all this stuff is more subtle than they think. Yeah, I think I think those are excellent points. And if I may, I will I'd like to dive into the automatic point a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So I talk to lots of people about bias within organizations and I get a lot of frustration. People tell me, well, if this thing is automatic, it's based on cultural learning and history, what can I do about it? Right? There's nothing I can do about it besides knowing that I have it. And I often say that there's a role for awareness as yeah. well. Awareness functions <laughs> sort of at the structural level, knowing that there are these problems, as you suggested, the organization has to take responsibility. But also as the individual actor yourself, if you're aware that you have these biases, you can check, right? You can delay, give yourself a chance to sort of go over your decisions to make sure that you're not being susceptible. And lots of people don't find that very satisfying of a response. <laughs> so are there other strategies that you would recommend related to this unintentional automatic process that's yeah. running rapid in most of us that we could employ? To yeah, really yeah. So I think, I think there are several things you can do as a decision maker. So as a professor, when I grade student papers, I grade them blind to the identity of the student. Because that way, I know I'm not being biased by the per person's ethnicity, for example, or by the fact that they were annoying to me on the first day of class. <laughs> you know, and the students know that I'm grading them blind. And so they know that the feedback I'm giving them has nothing to do with who I think they are. And, you know, it, it's an interesting exercise because you always are guessing in a seminar, oh, this must be so and so. And I'm wrong so often that it makes me glad that I'm doing it blind. And you know, there's the famous study with the orchestra where, you know, all the people auditioning for orchestra, it was the Boston Symphony, um, were getting the jobs were men until they put people behind a screen, and then they got more women. You know, so there's countless examples where if you can blind yourself to the identity of the people you're evaluating that helps. Now, in most job situations, you can't do that all the way through the process. At some point, you have to see the face of the person you're you know, evaluating. But at least you can get further down the road. And, and I think the other thing you can do is specify the criteria ahead of time. It's all too easy to say, oh, this person from this group that's not my group you know, they would be better if they had more experience, you know, but they've got a great degree. And then the next person is from your group and you say, well, experience doesn't matter. They have great credentials, <laughs> you know, and so it's too slippery. Um, but I, I totally agree with your point that if you're aware of these processes, then you can examine them. And so I have a 
colleague um, who's a sort of legal scholar who studies this stuff. And she says, it's better not to call it unconscious or unintentional or even subtle because that implies lack of responsibility. But she said, you can call it unexamined, which means that normally we go about our business and we have our biased judgments, but you can potentially examine them. Yeah, I like that approach. I think even in psychology, I think within 10 years, implicit bias as a term is going to go away, hopefully, because the more we understand it, the more we realize it's not really about <clears throat> whether it's below the level of consciousness or not, right? That doesn't impact the responsibility you have. Right. And there's right. some sort of taking of responsibility that happens with implicit bias. It yeah. also means that people use the training as a checkbox exercise, right? To say, yeah. see, I've certified I'm not implicitly biased and that doesn't really help their behavior. Well, the other thing about implicit bias, I mean, I think taking the test makes you aware of your own biases. And when you do it in a group training, there's always nervous laughter when people realize what they're doing. Um, so I think it clearly has a place in creating a teachable moment. Um, so I don't think it's unconscious because you can feel yourself doing it. Um, but, I, but you bring up the issue of training and I think that's an important one. So the evidence these days is very discouraging about training. Basically, it's very hard to make it work. And the only really strong evidence I've seen, well, I've seen two kinds of evidence. One is bias reduction by um, constructive intergroup contact. So if you bring groups of people together for a serious purpose where they have shared goals and they have equal status, and as the authority, you know, you say this is really important for our, the goal of our organization, people get over it. If they have to work together or else not get the bonus, <laughs> you know, they will. So I think there's pretty good evidence for that. Although, you know, could we use more experiments? Yes, we could use more experiments. But then I think the other thing is that if you're going to do, quote, diversity training, if you think that people acquire this from a whole lifetime of experience, you think it's going to go away in two hours of class? No, or you know, a half hour video, no. So it has to be repeated. It has to be varied. People have to want to do it because if they sit in the back row and elbow each other or you know, watch the video while they're watching something else on another channel, you know, it's not gonna have any impact. So uh, Patricia Devine at, at Wisconsin has what I think of as the sort of everything bagel of diversity training, she throws everything at people and she does it repeatedly over time. And she does it with willing participants and she gets effect up, effects up to two years later. So, you know, these are University of Wisconsin undergraduates so we don't know whether, but she's, but she's beginning to do it in police departments and, you know, outside the university. So I think we have to learn a lot more about diversity training and what works but it's certainly not just tick the box because, you know, that has no effect. Yeah, I agree completely. I think the willingness of the participant is, is really key. And, and when we do diversity training or versions of it, um, even here within the university, I always insist that it's voluntary as a prerequisite. Yes. Yes. Um, and I think that leads to sort of my, my final sort of question surrounding organizations. So oftentimes when people make a case to organizations about why they should care about diversity, um, the, the inclination is to make a social justice case and to make an argument about this is the morally right mm -hmm. thing to do. Mm -hmm. But there's also quite an overwhelming business case showing that companies be, function better as a company if they have a more diverse workforce. Could you talk a little bit about why diversity has these benefits, right? So what's the sort of big positives that you get with diversity. Well, let me just say one quick thing first about the moral argument. Yeah. It turns out that underrepresented groups prefer the moral argument. You know, it's like, do this because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> and I don't think that's a bad argument at all. I mean, you know, why, 
oppress people arbitrarily. <laughs> um, but if you don't believe that that's correct, you know, then I think you have to entertain the business case for diversity. And, you know, the most obvious case is if you have a diverse customer base, you need diverse customer facing people to represent your company. Otherwise, otherwise the consumers are going to go away. You know, and that's true whether they're students, you know, deciding about university or clients or whatever they are. Um, but, you know, that's kind of superficial and kind of optics. And optics are important. They're important for signaling seriousness about this. But you have to go beyond the optics. And people who have different experiences have different things to bring to the table. And if you want a group of people who all think alike and never change and are stuck in some previous decade, then keep your organization homogeneous. If you want to move into the 21st century and have innovations and new ideas and new perspectives, then have a diverse workforce. So, you know, there's a fair amount of evidence that diverse teams are more innovative. Now, that comes with an initial bit of friction. So when you integrate a previously homogeneous team or workplace, people are a little nervous about it, you know, and they're a little, uh, you know, frustrated and annoyed and afraid even. But if you can get people to see how important it is, and if you can do batch hiring or batch integration, so it's not just one, one person who's <laughs> martyred on the cause of diversity. Um, but if you, if you have a significant number of people from different groups, <clears throat> then what happens is that these differences in perspective are quite innovative and creative. And there's even some evidence that it increases the bottom line. Oh, it certainly does. I think there's, there's enough data the economists have figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, Susan, thank you so much for a very wonderful and engaging conversation. I'm sure our reviewers enjoyed it. Um, thank you again. Sure. Happy to do it. <laughs>